Senator Bernie Sanders, it's great to see you. You were five years ago, almost to the day, the uh, first guest on my podcast. I, I think you're the 407th as well. And so it's such a pleasure to have you back, especially at such a consequential time. So thank you uh, for doing this. We've got an audience here from the Institute of Politics at the University of Chicago. Um, and so before we plunge into current events, I do have to ask you, uh, 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 this one historical bit, which is you and I have a similar history, sons of Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe. You grew up in New York City. You went to the public schools there, spent a year at Brooklyn College, which was a public institution there. And then you came to the University of Chicago. What, what caused you to transfer to the University of Chicago? Um, well, two factors, I think. Uh, the more significant one is my mother had died uh, some months before my first year in, in Brooklyn College. And it was just time for me to get out of uh, my house, get out of Brooklyn, uh, and to look for something new. Um, Brooklyn College was a good, good college, but I just wanted to get away from Brooklyn. Uh, and then it turns out um, <laughs> a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, had gone to the uh, University of Chicago. He said it was a good place. I applied, and there I was. You know, um, I, I, have, I don't have access to your transcripts, but I'm given to believe that you pretty much measured in activism here uh, <laughs> more than any particular uh, subject. And that Bernie Sanders really sort of became Bernie Sanders in some ways uh, during those years in Chicago. Well, David, that's accurate. I, I think I, I will give you insight to those transcripts <laughs> and they will clearly show that I was not one of the outstanding students in the history of the University of Chicago. Uh, join the club. <laughs> <laughs> As a matter of fact, the dean requested that I take a little bit of time off uh, to think about my academic future. Um, but uh, I think there were two factors at the university that shaped me. Number one, it, it certainly was uh, an extraordinary uh, intellectual environment, and the classes were very, very good but it also had a wonderful, wonderful library. Uh, it was then called the Harper Library. I don't know yep. what it is called today. Still Harper Library. Still Harper. And I used to bury myself in the bowels of what they called the stacks. That If a nuclear yep. war took place, one would not have known it. We <laughs> were way, way down below and just reading everything that there was to be read, except for my class subjects. Uh -huh. Uh, so I learned a lot, not necessarily in what I was supposed to be learning. And second of all, it was a, an environment in Hyde Park uh, where I was exposed to a lot of people uh, and ideas that I had previously not been exposed to in terms of the civil rights movement, the trade union movement, uh, the peace movement. So I think all of those factors together really did help uh, shape uh, me to become uh, the person and the, the, the politician that I am. You led a sit-in against segregated housing, uh, student housing at the University of Chicago. You got involved in the movement to desegregate the public schools uh, in Chicago. That was 60 years ago. And um, uh, thinking about where we are today, and when you look at the protests of today, um, how much have we progressed and, and what similarities do you see between the movements of today and the movement that you were involved in as a young man uh, back then? Well, different worlds, uh, different problems. In some ways, the bottom line remains the same. Uh, remember when uh, I was involved a very long time ago, you still had a situation in the South where segregation was rampant. Uh, African-Americans could not vote. Uh, people like John Lewis were getting their heads busted open uh, for trying to get basic uh, and elemental civil rights uh, for African Americans. Uh, that has, you know, to a significant degree, changed. Uh, you had a situation in Chicago where there was a, uh, it was the, the segregation, especially the school segregation was rampant. As you indicated, the University of Chicago, a great liberal institution was running segregated housing. I think that's changed as well. Uh, but where we are as a nation today is my great fears, and I know you have heard me say this for a number of years, is that we are moving toward above and beyond Donald Trump. 
we are moving toward an oligarchic form of society where you have three people owning more wealth than the bottom half of America, where you have a fairly corrupt political system which allows billionaires to buy elections, uh, where you have uh, half of our people are living paycheck to paycheck uh, while the very richest people are becoming phenomenally richer, uh, where we are not addressing the existential threat of climate change, where we are the only remaining country on major country not to guarantee health care to all people through a national health care program. So, I mean, the world has changed very radically, but it, bottom line to me is you still have a very small number of people with incredible wealth and power uh, controlling what goes on economically and politically, uh, while the vast majority of the people are struggling. You know, I suspect a number of the students who are listening uh, to our discussion right now um, uh, thoroughly agree with you. And that's one of the reasons why you had such a uh, phenomenally enthusiastic following uh, among the young. Now you're out there and you're vigorously campaigning for Joe Biden, who obviously has more moderate views uh, than you do. And there are a lot of these young people who are asking the question, well, why? Why should we follow him? Because he is not who Bernie Sanders is. He is not taking that approach. His philosophy is somewhat different. Well, look, the answer is, uh, I, I think, uh, let me answer it in two ways. Uh, I consider Donald Trump to me to be the most dangerous president in the history of this country. And it's not just that he's a pathological liar. Uh, it's not just that he does not believe in science in terms of the pandemic, where we have done a terrible, terrible job, or in climate change. He thinks climate change is a hoax, I guess. Um, but he is a real threat to American democracy. I just gave a speech yesterday yes. uh, where I made the point that I think more and more people understand for the first time in the history of this country. We have a president who has said pretty openly that he may not step down even if he loses the election. So if you believe in democracy, if you believe in science, if you believe in civil rights, and racial justice, if you believe in the need to combat climate change by transforming our energy system away from fossil fuel, if you happen to believe that healthcare is a human right and that all of our people should have it, you know what, you can't sit out this election. And let me say something, and some people may take it the wrong way. And that is, you know, there are millions of people in this country today, in Illinois, all over this country, Vermont, who are working for starvation wages. Now, what Biden, you're right, David, Biden's views on many issues are different than mine. But one area that we do agree with is that the minimum wage should be raised to at least 15 bucks an hour. This country should join every other major country and have paid family and medical leave, that we should have universal childcare. Now, if you come from a wealthy family, that may not mean much to you. 15 bucks an hour, not a lot of money. But let me tell students out there, that if you're making 12 bucks an hour today and you make 15 bucks an hour tomorrow, it is a profound difference in your life. You have a little bit of security. So don't tell me you're gonna sit it out and ignore the pain of millions of people who are working for starvation wages. You can't do that. You're concerned about racial justice and Black Lives Matter. Well, you know what? You got a president who is a racist today. He's gotta be defeated. Joe Biden and I may disagree on criminal justice reform, but he will be strong on that issue. He will be strong on climate change, not as go as far as I would want. So, and the second point that I would make is not only the need to defeat Trump, is that if we can elect a Democratic Senate and maintain a Democratic House, you're going to see progressives like myself coming up with an agenda that is very, very strong. We're not going to give up on the Green New Deal. We're not giving up on Medicare for all. Now, Joe and I will have disagreements. We'll fight it out within the political system. But I intend to work aggressively for an extremely progressive agenda in the Senate, and we need young people to help us. Last point that I would make. This generation, David, and I have been all over this country, and I say this from the bottom of my heart, this generation is a beautiful, beautiful generation. It is yeah. the most progressive generation in American history. 
This is a generation, it is extremely anti-racist, anti-sexist, anti-homophobic, anti-xenophobic, uh, anti-religious bigotry. And if this younger generation, people under 30, voted at the same level that people over 65 voted, we would transform this country. We would transform this country. So I say to the young people out there, yeah, you know, Biden and Bernie Sanders have differences of opinion, but the immediate task is to defeat the most dangerous president in American history. And after Biden is inaugurated, let's get to work in making sure that Biden becomes the most progressive president in modern American history. And we can do that if we have a Democratic Senate and a Democratic House. You know, uh, tr to hear uh, Trump tell it, uh, Biden is, is merely your chariot. He's your Trojan horse. Uh, you know, they, uh, he can't say it enough. And, and this has been repeated by his amen corner on the right that, you know, uh, Biden is a weak, uh, a weak person and that actually this is a, a way in which you can usher in your agenda. And it strikes me that you're striking a, a pretty uh, interesting balance because you are out there and you're vigorously campaigning for Biden, but you also don't want to be used. So, uh, you know, for Trump's purposes. And so this point you're making about the differences that you have, uh, in addition to being factual, may also be useful uh, to Biden in terms of because his appeal is to people or perhaps to the to the right of you. And I mean, that's one of the reasons Trump fears him. Is that not the case? Well, look, all, all I can say, I'm not going to speculate what goes on in Trump's mind. I am not that smart. <laughs> I, and I think what goes on in his mind changes every 28 seconds. But <laughs> You know, all I can say is, look, I ran against Joe Biden. I know Joe Biden's positions. Joe is more conservative than I am. I mean, there's no debate about that. I guess all that I'm saying is two things. If you look at Joe's proposals on economics, for example, on climate change, they're not where I am, but they're pretty good proposals. And what I'll do as the United States Senate do is I'll try to push him in his pro-working class, pro-progressive place as I can. That's what, you know, democracy is, is, is about. Uh, so, you know, mm -hmm. that, that's kind of where we are. You know, uh, uh, Trump's appeal to uh, working class white voters has been largely on cultural grounds invoking race and, Im you know, immigration and a sense of besiegement and a sense of loss. You've been quoted as saying that you want Biden to emphasize economic issues more. Is that the best way to combat uh, the, the, the cultural appeal of Trump to those voters? Well, David, you know, what I think, I, I have said this, and this is going to get me in a lot of trouble again, but that's kind of what you, I do. You've never minded that before. I never minded. You know, I think <laughs> the, the rise of Trumpism speaks to the failure of the Democratic Party. And I think what you have is a situation where back in FDR's time in the 1930s, Harry Truman's time in the 40s, if you ask the average person, which political party is the party of the American working class? Everybody would have said, Democrats are the party of the working class, the Republicans are the party of big money interest. And what happened for a lot of reasons, which we don't have the time to get into now, is the Democratic Party evolved and moved in a direction where it took a lot of money from corporate interests and it kind of moved away from the working class of this country. And workers saw that. And Trump came along, and of course he lies all of the time. And he said, I am gonna take on the entire establishment. I'm gonna fight with everybody for your behalf. And people said, well, you know what? I am, my job went to China. I'm making starvation wages. My kid can't afford to go to college. I can't afford healthcare. Hey, Trump may be crazy, but you know, why not? I'll give it a shot. And uh, I think what the Democratic Party has got to do is start not only speaking to, but fighting for the working class. But you can't do that if you're beholden to big money interests. You got to take on Wall Street and their greed and irresponsible behavior. You got to have the courage to tell the insurance companies that healthcare is a human right, not a commodity. 
in which they can make billions of dollars. You got to take on the thieves and the crooks in the pharmaceutical industry whose policies kill people every single day. Not to mention that we lose tens of thousands of people who die in America because they can't get the health care that they need. Does that sound like the Democratic Party to you, David? The, uh, the, the issue of money, as you, uh, as you raised, has shifted dramatically, though, and you've had something to do with it. The, the, small, dollar, the, yes. the small dollar donations has actually put Democrats in a much more advantageous position and in a position to be freer on some of these issues that you mentioned. Absolutely. But what I'm saying is, and I'm very proud of it, you know, one of the things that we, have, of many things that I think our movement has accomplished is that we showed, not only in my race, but in progressive congressional races, you can run, you can win, you can do well without corporate PAC money. You don't have to be beholden to the rich. You don't have to spend half your life in the living rooms of millionaires begging for money. Uh, and when you can break that chain, and you don't have to be dependent upon them. You know what? You could start talking about the truth. But bottom line is, I think most people, emotionally, if not necessarily intellectually, understand that we live in a very corrupt type of society where the rich get richer, working people struggle, poor get poorer, uh, and that we need a movement of people to stand up to the greed and irresponsibility of the corporate elite. Now, there are an increasing number of us in Congress who hold that view, not a majority. And this is the kind of the Democratic Party is going to have to make a choice which side they are on. And I think ultimately, from a moral perspective, as well as a successful political perspective, they're going to have to be on the side of the working class of this country. Let's talk about the Supreme Court. Uh, you're going to be voting, it, it appears, rather quickly on a Supreme Court nominee. The president's going to reveal that nominee uh, over the weekend. And it seems uh, certain that uh, at this point that Republicans will have the votes to seat his nominee. That's the third appointee of uh, Trump on the Supreme Court. Um, I know that you can speak to the implications you feel this will have on a whole range uh, of issues, but I just want to ask you about the process itself. Uh, you know, Republicans say, and, and I think they're probably right about this, if Democrats were in the same position and this vacancy came open, given the gravity of the appointment and the meaning for, for the future, that Democrats would encourage that a Democrat president to appoint someone and, and you in Congress would, would be... Uh, moved to try and confirm them before uh, that president, uh, that president's term. I isn't that true? I don't know, David. I really don't. Uh, not been in that position uh, to have to make that decision. All I can say is you are looking at extraordinary hypocrisy. Yeah, that I, I, I grant you that. All right. You know, Merrick Garland came up, Obama nominated him. And all these great speeches, well, it's a year before the election, let the people decide, course, elect the next course. president. And now people are voting today. I, I think by the time uh, this vote takes place in the Senate, my guess will be that many millions of people will have already voted for Joe Biden right. to be president. They want him to make that choice. And what Republicans are saying, sorry, we got the White House now, we're going to ram this through. Uh, I think that that is wrong. I think it's unfortunate. And I will join with other Democrats to do everything we can to stop it or delay it. But your point is, you know, it's going to be very, very, I don't want to, yeah. you know, make people overly confident. They have uh, 53 votes. We have 47. Two Republicans have indicated they will vote against the nominee for the reasons that I'm giving. That's 51-49. Yeah, the math, the math is the math. Do you think that there was anything that could have been done back uh, in 2016 uh, to try and force a vote on Garland? Uh, I, you know, I'm not the world's greatest expert on Senate rules. They are complicated, but the truth is, uh, to move the Senate along, you need something called unanimous consent, UCs, or else it takes a long time to do anything. Uh, were the Democrats as aggressive as they should have been to slow it down? I'm not so sure. Mm-hmm. And in terms of, you, there's discussion now about whether or not uh, Democrats, if you guys take the Senate, 
if there is a Democratic president and Joe Biden, well, you should restructure the court, uh, add some seats, uh, perhaps term limits, uh, structural changes, uh, because right now uh, what you have, and the ar this is the argument, you have three people appointed by a president who got fewer votes than his opponent, ratified by a Senate that represents less than a majority of the country. You know, David, I'm not a, a historian with regard to the Supreme Court, but this is what concerns me very much. You know, one, when you're in elementary school, or maybe taking political science at the University of Chicago, I don't know, you think that the function of the Supreme Court is to sit around and, and to look at the constitutional aspects of, you know, this or that uh, moment, this or that legislation. Uh, but I think what many people perceive right now is, you know, you got the House is Democrat, you got the Republicans controlling the Senate, and you got Republicans controlling, you know, the uh, United States Supreme Court. Uh, and it's not this great, you know, constitutionally deliberative body, it's a political body. And that worries me. I mean, you know, it's one thing to have a House and a Senate, but you have, you know, everybody knows what the votes will be. You know, Judge Thomas will vote. We know what Lau will vote. Uh, so I think, you know, I, I don't know the answer. I'm not a lawyer and I'm not a judge for sure. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I think it, it's appropriate uh, that we take a hard look. You know, Chuck Schumer said, you know, everything should be on the table. Yeah. I don't know what the answer will be, but I think we should start taking a look at some of the structural uh, parts of American society. What about the filibuster, Senator? Uh, I think that's got to be looked at as well. And I have come out and said that I think uh, that we cannot have a minority of the United States Senate uh, prevent the majority of doing what the American people want. So I would be in favor of ending the filibuster. You know, Joe Biden uh, spent 36 years in the Senate. As you know, he's kind of a man of the institution. He's been more hesitant than you to speak uh, on that. Have you talked to him about this? No, not on that issue. I have not. And do you, do you expect that he will be moved to be supportive of? Well, you know, it's, it, this is, you know, Joe Biden is not Donald Trump and he doesn't, he's not an authoritarian type guy. You're right. He's a, he's, he spent 36 years in the, in, in the Senate. He's an institutionalist. And what he understands in his heart is you got a house, you got a Senate and you got a president. The president does not determine Senate rules. Mm -hmm. That is what the Senate will do and the House will do its thing. Uh, and, uh, you know, we will, again, see what happens. You know, on this position, on, on this question of, and this is what frustrates, I know a lot of the young people who are listening, but people generally, uh, you do have uh, what I've called kind of a tyranny of, tyranny of the minority at times uh, in, in, uh, in Washington. Uh, and part of it has to do with the way our government is structured. There was a poll today that uh, said uh, that 61% uh, said we should do away with the Electoral College because it disadvantages large yeah. states and advantages yeah. small states. You come yeah. from a small rural state, so you're conflicted on this question. Right. But what, what do you think about it? I think that's the direction we have got to go. And I'll tell you why. Uh, it, it's a, it's hard to defend, if you believe in democracy, it's hard to defend a system in which in 2016, Hillary, Cl Hillary Clinton got 3 million more votes than Donald Trump, but she's not the president. So on the surface, that's pretty hard to defend. The second point I would say as a politician is that you know, David, and I know, that the overwhelming majority of states in our country, we got 50 states, and yet this entire campaign is going to take place within 15 or 16 states, all right? If that, yeah. Right. And so if you're in California or in Vermont, which will vote for Joe Biden, or you're in Illinois, or you are in New York State, no one cares about the problems in your state. Or if you're uh, conversely in Wyoming or South Carolina or whatever, there are states that are going to vote Republican, states that are going to vote Democrat. Who cares about those states? I am deeply worried about Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania. We're listening to their needs. That's not fair to the other 35 states in this country. So I want a candidate running for president to be concerned about the needs of 50 states in this country, not just a few. So I think uh, 
you know, I, I think we've got to move away from the uh, electoral college. I know you, you bridle, and I understand why, uh, at the suggestion of some supporters of, of uh, Hillary Clinton that you didn't do enough for her and that contributed to her defeat. I know you've made 30 appearances for her uh, late in that campaign. Yes, I do bridle. I know You're you right. do. I know. I know you do. I know. Look, you do. there are Bernie haters out there. No, no, no. What you I don't want. I don't want to. We don't have that yeah. much time, and I don't want to relitigate that. The point is, you seem to have a much warmer relationship uh, with with Biden. You also, it was reported that you you kind of cautioned your team that you know about how to approach Biden in the uh, election. Um, were there things that you learned from the 2016 experience that shaped how you approach Biden as a front, as a, as a guy who might be the nominee? Look, in 2016, I understood how dangerous Donald Trump could be. Unfortunately, I was right. And I did everything I could to elect Hillary Clinton. I knocked my brains out and urged, you know, my supporters to, to vote for her. Uh, you know, I have known Biden in a way that I have not known uh, Hillary. Uh, and, you know, he was, as you mentioned, a longtime member of the Senate. We got to know each other there. I got to know him a little bit when he was vice president. So, you know, uh, Joe and I have talked on a number of occasions. We have our disagreements, uh, but I intend to work as hard as I can. We have already held, uh, David, so you know this, we have held 12 virtual rallies in nine states, nine battleground states, plus a wonderful meeting with rank and file trade unionists. Just a few days ago, we did a uh, virtual rally with the Latino community, and Julian uh, Castro was there, mm -hmm. Univision covered it. And we're going to do more of those. We're going to do uh, rallies with young people, uh, the African American community. Uh, we're going to do everything we can in every way. And I'm probably going to be hitting the road as well. So I am all in to defeat Donald Trump and to elect Joe Biden. You, uh, you had uh, the occasion to debate Biden uh, many times in the course of the campaign, culminating in the last, which is, was just the two of you were headed into this debate on Tuesday night. Uh, that seems very consequential. Uh, what advice would you give? By, you've, you've observed Trump. Uh, first of all, I should ask you, are you going to be sitting there saying, man, I wish I was up there. I'd love to have a piece well, of that. Well, it's funny you mentioned Jane and I were just over <laughs> breakfast this morning talking about it. And I was saying, you know, I don't know how I would debate this guy. Because for a start, this is not going to be a debate about the intricacies of our healthcare system <laughs> or foreign policy or climate change. This is going to be a, a debate about a guy who lies all of the time. How do you deal with that? Yeah, how do you? Yeah. I don't envy. I mean, you know, I'm not going to be on the debate stage, so I don't have to think it through. But it is not so easy. If you're not a liar, how do you confront somebody who lies all of the time? How do you not stoop to their level and yet not let them get away with absurd remarks? Yeah, uh, it's, it's tough, but uh, you know, I'm confident that Joe will figure it out. Yeah, no, it's a... Uh, it, it is a challenge not to chase rabbit uh, rabbits down exactly. the hole because the, he creates rabbit holes every time he exactly every time he speaks. And before we get to questions uh, from uh, uh, our students, and we'll break away from the podcast for that, um, let me uh, ask you about yourself. Uh, you know, when we met five years ago, you were. Um, you were sort of an up and coming presidential candidate. You were just breaking through. It was in the fall of 2015. There were thousands of kids waiting for you at the University of Chicago, but you began that year almost, uh, you know, uh, barely known nationally, you, you know, and um, now, you know, you've been through these two presidential races. You, you have created a movement, um, probably not going to run for president again, though I never want to make that judgment for you. Um, how do you see this, this act in your, uh, in your career? Well, I am very proud, David, of what we have accomplished, uh, what millions of people have accomplished. You mentioned one example is we have transform, transformed campaign finance in America so that you have candidates all over this country who are saying, I don't want big money. I don't want rich people's money. I'm going to take working class people's money. When they get elected, they stand up for working class people. So you're seeing a transformation in the Congress, 
Uh, we're electing really some strong progressives we did in 2018. Uh, we're doing it right now in 2020. We look to, uh, forward to picking up some more progressive Congress people in Texas and other parts of the, con uh, of the country. The issues that we have fought for Medicare for all is now I think supported by a majority of the American people who know how dysfunctional and wasteful and cruel the current healthcare system is. Five years ago when we talked about $15 an hour, it seemed to be a radical idea today. It's mainstream, supported by a majority of the American people. More and more people, not enough, know how threatening climate change is for our planet. Mm -hmm. The idea of making public colleges and universities tuition free, widely accepted. So we have made real progress and our movement is alive, it's vibrant, and it is growing. So I feel pretty good about you what know, we have done and where I read, we're going. I read uh, with interest that you, uh, your first campaign uh, was for class president at James Madison High School, also, by the way, uh, the alma mater of, of Justice Ginsburg. Right. Uh, you two probably the most celebrated of their, of their graduates. Well, but Chuck Schumer would be offended. He went there, too. <laughs> uh, Okay, we'll throw him in. I thought he went to Brooklyn Tech, but the no. but but the uh, but the 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 question um, that ca the thing that came up was, you ran, you lost, and then your opponent embraced your your main plank, which I guess was uh, providing aid to Korean immigrants. Yeah. So this is a long time habit of yours, right? You run, you raise the issue, <laughs> force your opponent to embrace it. I'm sure you'd prefer the alternative, but. Well, sometimes I don't lose. I am a United States senator. <laughs> senator yes. So I win occasionally. <laughs> um, yeah, by, by more than a few votes, I should say. Right. But I think that, you know, one of the things I've always believed, David, is, you know, if you can raise public consciousness, then the so-called leaders will follow where people are. If the American people say, look, healthcare is a human right, we don't need health insurance companies to make billions of dollars off of human suffering. The politicians will follow. And, um, you know, you mentioned <laughs> that race. It was the question whether we should help finance a, a child in South Korea. That was after the Korean War. And, um, and, you know, in a sense, that's what I continue to do, to try to raise public consciousness and say, why not? Why not? You know, why shouldn't we guarantee health care to all people? You know, why shouldn't we have the best educational system in the world available to all regardless of your income? And people sit there and say, hey, you know, you're right. You're right. That makes sense to me. And then things begin to change. Yeah, well, I will say this, and then I'm going to, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, thank you for being with me, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to questions from our students. But I think uh, <coughs> fundamentally your appeal is that you believe what you believe and you haven't been reluctant to say what you believe. And it's been very consistent over a long period of time. And that is not, that is an admirable uh, aberration in our politics and uh, you deserve great credit for that. So it's always fun to be with you because uh, I know what I'm gonna get. <laughs> well, thank uh, you very much, David. <laughs> um, and thank you for, for this, uh, Senator. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to read these questions to try and speed uh, this along. Uh, Jade, who's a second year student in the college, asks, "What advice would you give to a fellow University of Chicago student? She still counts you in, who wants to cultivate social change on campus?" Well, as you indicated earlier, um, I was very involved uh, when I was a student at the U of C. Um, I think. Two things. Uh, pick cogent issues and just try to connect with the outer community and not just with the student community. Um, if you're interested in issues like economic justice, reach out to some of the unions uh, in the Chicago area. You've got some great unions out there. If you're interested in racial justice issues, reach out to off-campus organizations. Don't just isolate yourself on campus, but become part of a broader movement. Uh, and I would also add is that uh, to Jade, media doesn't talk about it much, 
but there are tens of millions of people in our country who are hurting, especially during this pandemic, economically. You got people not far away from where you are on campus who are hungry tonight. They are hungry. They don't have enough food to feed their kids. They can't afford to go to the doctor. They're worried about being evicted from their homes. Reach out to those people. Try to create a, a, a coalition uh, of working class people, black and white and Latino, make it inclusive. Amy, an incoming student at, at, at the Harris School asks, what are, are some specific policies you would propose to constrain the powers of the office of the president given the misuse in the past four years? Well, uh, it, 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 I mean, there's a lot that can be done, but it's not just the problem with somebody like a Trump is he doesn't pay attention to the Constitution. He doesn't pay attention to the rule of law. And what I would say to Amy, one of the scariest things that is happening is not just Donald Trump and his move toward authoritarianism. What is even more frightening is the degree to which a Republican Party has lockstep, almost lockstep, fallen in behind them. That I would not necessarily have predicted. And if you had 15 or 20 United States senators who stood up today and said, hey, Mr. President, are you a nut? Of course you are going to mm -hmm. respect the results of this election. We're going to throw you out of office ourselves. He would calm down. But he knows there are very few Republicans who are prepared to stand up to him. So I would say, Amy, the problem is not just this or that law, uh, because you do have a constitution uh, and a lot of laws. It is creating a movement of people who demand that any president uh, be a president who respects the law and respects the constitution. Andre, a second year at the Harris School, said, as we have observed in recent months, China has taken increasingly aggressive posturing militarily, politically, and economically in ways that are detrimental to American interests. How do we counter China's quest for this hegemony while ensuring that our global footprint in terms of military presence does not rise? Well, you know, I worry a lot about what has been going on in China in many respects. They cracked down uh, in Hong Kong. Um, their so-called detention centers for Muslims in China, their movement to even more authoritarianism. Uh, but I uh, fear very much that we have in Trump a president who is kind of fomenting uh, another Cold War. Uh, so the first thing I think we would want to do is to sit down with China and figure out how we can resolve our differences without having to spend on both sides huge amounts of money uh, on uh, the military. But I think, you know, clearly uh, we have got to be prepared to stand up to China. But our first step should be to try to not foment our uh, disagreements and to see if to what degree uh, we can work out our disagreements. Jason, a first year in the college says, what do you believe is the best way to begin moving the U.S. population to a point where we can have civil discourse again? Growing up in a time in which political tensions are so high, how are we able to get to a point where people can have a political conversation or debate without it becoming a fight? Well, that's a very good question. It's, it's not easily answered. Uh, I think one of the things we may want to do is take a hard look at um, you know, Facebook and other social media platforms which have allowed the spread of really crazy disinformation. Because if you believe some of the stuff that is appearing some of those right-wing conspiracy theories, if you actually believe that stuff, your head's going to be in a certain place. So I think we need to do our best uh, through social media and the media in general to create fact-based debates. We can disagree on this or that issue, but we should not disagree on, uh, on the facts. So I think that's an important uh, step forward. And second of all, you know, I think treat people who disagree with you with respect. Uh, they're not deplorable. Uh, they are human beings. And you want to sit down and say, look, we have a disagreement uh, and, and go from there. And I think once you get into that, uh, you begin to find, and I've always believed this, David, that there is a lot more that people have in common than media tells us. I mean, if you talk to people about raising the minimum wage, equal pay for equal work, 
Uh, if you talk to the people about whether healthcare is a human right or not, uh, you're going to find people saying, well, you know what, you got a point. So try to bring people together around uh, areas where there is, in fact, common interest. Uh, Jonathan, a first year uh, student, as, says Senator Sanders, if Democrats regain control of Congress and the presidency in 2020, what specific policies would you push uh, for to address the injustices of police brutality and systemic racism? Well, absolutely. We have a long, long list of issues uh, that we would push. Look, this, I don't have to tell anybody uh, viewing this that uh, we have not only a broken and racist criminal justice system, we are in deep, deep need of police department reform uh, all over this country. Uh, it is not acceptable that African Americans who walk the streets are afraid, uh, that people get into a car are afraid of being unjustly stopped, uh, that people are being killed by police officers. That's not acceptable. So what we can do in a variety of ways is have the federal government through carrots and sticks of uh, demand police department reform uh, all over this country. We do it financially. We punish those departments that are not doing the right thing. And we incentivize uh, departments to, in fact, do uh, the right thing. People sometimes forget you're a former mayor. Uh, you haven't signed on to the defunding police no. No. movement. No. The idea of not funding the police departments, makes that does not make sense to me. What makes sense to me is to understand that police are called upon today, David, to do so many things that are not necessarily mm -hmm. police work. In big cities, you have alcoholics who are sleeping out on the street. Is that a, a police job? You have tragedies all over this country where people who are mentally ill who are acting out, you know, maybe they're brandishing a knife. How do you deal with that person? Is that, shouldn't we be having people who understand psychiatry and how you address people when you have disturbances? How do you calm down the situation? And police officers do not necessarily receive the training to deal with mental illness, to deal with the issues of, of, of homelessness, uh, to deal with the needs of young people uh, in a way that they should. So I think we, we're talking about redefining policing in America, but that doesn't mean defunding uh, police departments. And here's the last <coughs> question, and I suspect that it's, uh, comes from, it comes from Alexandra, a fourth year student in the college. Sounds very much like she might be a supporter of yours. What are your thoughts on the weaponization of, ident of quote, identity politics by the corporate wing of the Democratic Party? Um, well, look, um, I, I'm not clear. What, what, explain to me why you, what you think she means by that. <laughs> I, I, I don't know because I'm getting these uh, questions in writing. But um, let, let, let's, let's actually finish. Uh, I tried to get at this before, and I'm going to repurpose her question um, with apologies and say um, the issue of identity politics, I mean, clearly the president of the United States is a identity politics player. Oh, absolutely. Of course. Of and course. I mean, if Alexandria, if Alexandria means do we have a president who is doing everything he can to divide us up, to play one group off against the other, that is exactly what he, he is doing. That is his modus operandi. And what we are trying to do as a movement is exactly the opposite. He wants to divide us up, you know, whether we're black, we're, we're white, we're Latino, Asian American, uh, gay or straight, a transgender, whatever we may be, let's, let's all get divided. Let's all fight amongst each other. And what the progressive movement is trying to do is exactly the opposite. We're trying to bring all of us together and say whether you're black or you're white or you're Latino, whether you may be young or old, you gotta be worried about climate change. You gotta have the guts to take on the fossil fuel industry. We all need affordable housing. We all need healthcare as a human right. We all need a good education. And we have got to take a hard look in coming together at who owns America who controls the political and economic system to a significant degree. Let's have the courage to take those guys on, but let's not fight amongst ourselves. Senator Sanders, thank you so much for your time. You've been generous with your time and uh, clearly uh, have a lot of energy <laughs> to share. Uh, so uh, very much appreciate it. Look forward to seeing you along the way. Okay, David, thank you very much. Take care.